Hey everyone, it's Sarah with RegisteredNurseRN.com and in this video we're going to talk about glaucoma. And as always, whenever you get done watching this YouTube lecture, you can access the free quiz that will test you on this condition. So let's get started. Glaucoma is a set of eye diseases that is caused by increased intraocular pressure. And whenever this happens, it results in optic nerve damage. So what does our optic nerve do? Well, this nerve helps transmit information that we see with our eyes to our brain. So it plays a huge role in giving us our vision. So if this nerve becomes damaged, the person's going to have vision loss that can eventually lead to permanent blindness. For instance, if this patient had open angle glaucoma, over time, eventually, they will notice that they're losing their peripheral vision, which is going to give them like tunnel vision. And if they don't get this treated where they're getting their interocular pressure lowered, it can eventually lead to permanent blindness. So in this lecture, we're going to talk about two types of glaucoma. The first type we're going to talk about is called open angle glaucoma. And this type is the most common form of glaucoma. Now, the thing you want to remember about this type is that its signs and symptoms are very subtle. The the patient's not going to really know that they have this type of glaucoma until the disease has really advanced. So we refer to this type as the silent type. The next type we're going to talk about is called angle closure glaucoma. Now you may also hear this referred to as narrow angle glaucoma or closed angle glaucoma. All those terms refer to this type of glaucoma. Now this type of glaucoma is very rare and it's signs and symptoms the patient is definitely going to notice them. And whenever the patient has this type of glaucoma, it requires immediate emergency treatment. So as a nurse, it's very essential that you know the differences between the signs and symptoms with open angle and angle closure glaucoma. Now with all types of glaucoma, you really want to stress to the patient that early detection is key because this disease can be detected on an eye exam that checks the intraocular pressure. And a little bit later, we're going to talk about that specific exam. So first let's talk about the pathophysiology of glaucoma. And to help us truly understand this disease process, we have to identify the key players that play a role in the pathophysiology. So our key players are the intraocular pressure, the eye IOP and the aqueous humor. So first, let's talk about IOP. What is this? Well, to help us understand that, let's take that word apart. Intra means within and ocular means eye. So when we put that together, we get the fluid pressure within the eye. And the fluid that we're specifically talking about is the aqueous humor. So intraocular pressure is calculated by the production rate and the drainage rate of this aqueous humor. Now, aqueous humor is produced in the eye specifically by the ciliary body, and it drains out through the eye and it's gonna go through the trabecular meshwork into like the drainage canals. So if your production rate and your drainage rate are not equal, you're gonna get increased intraocular pressure. But how in the world do we know a patient's IOP? Well, it can be detected through an eye exam and they can use a device called a tonometer. And this device will tell us what the patient's IOP is. Now, generally, a normal IOP in most people is about 10 to 21 millimeters of mercury. So now let's talk about aqueous humor. So we have established that this fluid helps maintain our IOP, but let's talk about how it really flows through this eye and really compare that to open and angle closure glaucoma. So here we have our eye and the view of this eye is if you were looking over someone and you took their eyeball and you just cut it in half and you were just looking at it. So this is the view of the eye that we're looking at. And here in the drawing we have in red, this is the the ciliary body and that produces again the aqueous humor. We have the lens. We have in purple, this represents the flow path of the aqueous humor. And then here in black, we have the pupil opening. And then the colored area in green is the iris, which is the color part of the eye. So our person has green eyes. And then we have the cornea, which is this area here in black. And then we have the trabecular meshwork and Schlem's canal. And that's how the aqueous humor is going to leave this part of the eye. So let's talk about how it flows normally. So the ciliary body produces the aqueous humor and it's going to go through the posterior chamber of the eye. And this is found between the iris and the lens. Then this aqueous humor is going to go through the pupil opening and it's going to enter into the anterior chamber of the eye 
which is found with the cornea and the iris. Then the aqueous humor should normally go down and we're hitting the drainage angles of the eye. And I want you to remember drainage angle because that is really the key concept in understanding closed angle or angle closure glaucoma versus open angle glaucoma. So it's going to go down through these drainage angles and it's going to hit the trabecular meshwork. Okay, it's meshwork. So this trabecular meshwork is like a strainer area. So the fluid's going to go down through there and then it's going to go into Schwimm's canal and then it's going to hit the episcleral veins and that's how it normally should drain out of the eye. But to help give you a better illustration, let's look at this animation. So here is a side view of the eye if you took it and you cut it in half and circled in red is the ciliary body which produces that aqueous humor. It's going to flow out through that posterior chamber, through the pupillary open, through the anterior chamber, and then it's going to go down into the trabecular meshwork, into the Schlem's canal and the episcleral veins. So as you can see, this aqueous humor is easily just flowing through the eye. But now let's talk about when this aqueous humor doesn't flow too great through the eye and it leads to increased intraocular pressure and we get damage to our optic nerve. So first let's talk about open angle glaucoma. So I pointed out these drainage angles and the drainage angle of the eye is formed with the cornea and the iris. So hence it's a drainage angle. It forms an angle between these two structures. Now in open angle glaucoma, this angle is open. So the aqueous humor can flow down to where it needs to go into the trabecular meshwork. But the problem with open angle is not the drainage angle, it's with the trabecular meshwork. Now I pointed out earlier to think of the meshwork as like a strainer because what happens is as we age, this meshwork becomes less flexible, it's less permeable, it becomes thicker. So it will become clogged. So this aqueous humor cannot get through the trabecular meshwork and we get increased pressure. And as you can see here, when the trabecular meshwork is not working, the fluid will start to collect in the eye and then you're going to get this increased pressure, which is going to put pressure on that optic nerve and can cause vision damage. So now let's talk about the signs and symptoms of open angle glaucoma. Well, as I pointed out earlier, the signs and symptoms are going to be, appear very subtly for that patient. And whenever they actually notice like that tunnel vision where they're having that loss of that peripheral vision, that means this disease has advanced. So through early detection, we can see some of these other signs and symptoms, which lets us know that, hey, this patient may have open angle glaucoma. So really it's silent in its presentation. And you may even hear it referred to as the thief of sight. But typically these patients are not going to have pain with this type of glaucoma compared to angle closure glaucoma. They're of course going to have increased intraocular pressure. Most patients will. And um, this will be found through various readings. Now again, how did we determine a patient's IOP? It was through a tonometer. And whenever they look at the patient's drainage angles, because you can look at the drainage angles through one of those eye exams, they can use a gonioscope to assess that. So that can tell us if they have angle closure or open angle. And they may have what's called optic disc cupping. And this can be assessed with an ophthalmoscope and you can look at the fundus of the eye and you can look at the optic disc to cup ratio. And the optic disc is found on the fundus and in the middle of the disc is the optic cup. So with chronic open angle glaucoma, the cup will become bigger compared to the disc. And here on the right, you will see a normal optic nerve. Notice the cup, it's the bright part in the middle is smaller compared to the disc. But here on the left, the optic cup is a lot bigger compared to the disc. Now let's talk about angle closure glaucoma. So again, with these drainage angles, we have the cornea and the iris and we have that angle. And what's happened is that this angle has narrowed. It has hence closed. So this aqueous humor cannot get down into the trabecular meshwork into Schlem's canal and do its thing. So we don't have a problem with trabecular's meshwork. It's that this angle has closed off and what's going to happen is this aqueous humor is going to build up in the, on the eye and it's going to really severely hinder this optic nerve. Now when this type of glaucoma happens, it is an emergency. It's rare to happen, but when it does, it, the person needs treatment immediately. And we're going to talk about those treatments a little bit later. So 
what could cause this to happen? Well, if a person already naturally has narrowed angles, an anatomical defect, that can cause it. But medications can cause this that dilate that pupil because what it can do is it can push the lens or the iris forward and when you push that forward you close that angle and medication that can do that is like anticholinergics and you want to educate patients who are at risk for this to avoid those type of medications because you can get these like over the counter with like allergy medicines antihistamines or COPD drugs or antidepressants so big risk with those now what are the signs and symptoms of this type of glaucoma well the patient is going to be able to notice them and they're not silent like with the other type of glaucoma so they can report severe eye pain they're gonna have a lot of pain with this type of glaucoma they can also have nausea and vomiting. They are going to have vision changes where their vision will be blurred from all that increased pressure. When they look at lights, they will see halos around the lights. Their eyes can be red. The pressure can just be so high that it can cause edema on the cornea, as you can see here in this picture. And of course, they're going to have very high IOP. Now let's talk about the key concepts that you want to know about glaucoma as the nurse. So to help us remember those key concepts, we're going to remember the word thief. So T is going to be about treatment goals and the treatment goal for the glaucoma of course is to reduce the intraocular pressure and this is going to help prevent damage to the optic nerve so medications are going to be the first line treatment for glaucoma most forms of medications are going to be in eye drops and patients can also receive oral meds and then surgical treatment can be provided and we're talking about like laser procedures or traditional eye surgery so first laser procedures um, a type of laser procedure that can be performed is called a selective laser trabeculoplasty, also known as an SLT. And this procedure is relatively quick compared to the traditional eye surgery that we'll talk about next. And it lowers the IOP by using lasers to target certain parts of that drainage angle tissue, which will cause changes to the tissue. And these changes will allow that extra aqueous fluid to drain out of the eye and will decrease IOP. Now, um, the thing about this is that the IOP will be lowered over several months and it's at not a permanent solution. Next is a more traditional type of eye surgery and it's typically performed when they can't decrease intraocular pressure in the eyes because eye drops or other procedures are not working. So a common type of traditional eye surgery is called a trabeculectomy. And this is where some of the trabecular meshwork is removed and an opening is created to allow aqueous humor to collect in an area of the conjunctiva. And this fluid will be reabsorbed and it will decrease IOP. Now the patient, whenever they have this procedure, will have what's called a bleb. And you can see that in this picture here. We're pointing to the bleb in yellow. And that is usually gonna be found under the upper eyelid. And this is where that fluid has collected. Now important thing to remember about these procedures is that vision that is lost already will not come back. These procedures are going to help control pressure for several years and they are not permanent. Now let's talk about the post-op education for a patient who's had glaucoma surgery and things you need to know as the nurse. So it's very important that you tell the patient that it's important that they go to all of their post-op appointments because here the doctor is going to be measuring their eye pressure and looking at other important post-op assessments. Also, they don't need to be driving until they've been cleared by their doctor. And if they have to go out in direct sunlight, they need to wear protective sunglasses. Also, they need to know how to instill eye drops, which we're going to talk about a little bit later, and to do it exactly as prescribed. Don't skip drops. Um, do some here. Do some another day. It needs to be exactly how the physician has ordered it because they're going to be taking antibiotics, anti-inflammatories, etc. And to always use clean hands whenever they do this. Plus, you need to tell the patient to refrain from rubbing their eyes because they may feel itchy after the procedure if they have stitches. Um, they don't want to use their contact lenses and they want to avoid activities that increase eye pressure. So you want to make sure that your patient isn't bending or doing straining activities like reading or even straining during a bowel movement because sometimes patients get constipated and they may need stool softeners during this time because we do not want them straining to get stool out because this increases their IOP or lifting heavy objects. Furthermore, you want to tell them that they need to wear their eye shield as prescribed. 
and um, they may have blurred vision, their eyes may tear up more frequently, and their eyes may feel itchy. This is normal after the procedure, and this will decrease over time. Also, they need to report any sudden vision loss or severe pain, and some pain is common because they've just had surgery on their eye and it's very vital they monitor for infection like any abnormal discharge a fever extreme eye redness they can have some but any extreme or any extreme vision changes but again blurred vision at first is normal then we have h for helpful to remember the three s's of open angle glaucoma so you definitely want to know the differences between open angle and angle closure so the three s's for open angle is silent sight stopper so silent represents the patient's going to be asymptomatic until it's too late because the irreversible damage has been done to that optic nerve when the patient actually notices the loss of peripheral vision and they have that tunnel vision. Next is sight. So the vision loss can't be brought back and once blindness occurs it's permanent and why does it occur? Because we've had increased intraocular pressure that has damaged that optic nerve. And then the last S, stopper. So the development of permanent vision loss slash blindness is stoppable, hence it's avoidable if glaucoma is identified early through an eye exam that checks for eye pressure. So let the patient know about this, especially the patients who are at risk for glaucoma, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. And um, we can prevent the loss of vision through medications or procedures that help keep that IOP low. Next is I for immediate treatment for angle closure glaucoma. So remember, this is an emergency and this is not a type of glaucoma that's going to be silent with its signs and symptoms. And medications can be used to lower that IOP like eye drops or oral medications along with a surgical procedure like a late laser iridotomy and this is where a small hole is created in the iris with a laser to drain that extra aqueous humor. Also, a more traditional surgery could be an iridectomy, and this is where they remove parts of the iris. And remember, the iris is that colored part of the eyes. So look at those eyeballs, it's the green part. And this may be performed in both eyes because there is a risk of both of those eyes actually developing angle closure glaucoma. So they can do that as a preventative measure. Next is E for eye drops. So now we're going to talk about how to administer eye drops to a patient. And I have a whole video, a link should pop up in the corner where I actually demonstrate how to do this, but I'm going to go over the highlights that you need to know. And then we're going to go into the different types of medications. So first you want to tell the patient that they don't want to skip days or abruptly stop taking the eye drops. So um, some of these patients, they have quite a few eye drops to take and they have to take them throughout the day. So it can be hard getting into that that routine and um, you want to stress to the patient that it's very very important that they take these eye drops exactly as prescribed because if they skip days and don't take them here or there they are ultimately risking losing their vision because these drops are made to help lower their IOP also you want to stress the importance of always washing your hands before instilling eye drops because that is one of the big ways we get sick whenever we use our hands you know we're touching surfaces that have bacteria, viruses in them. If we touch our eyes with those hands, we just transfer that virus or bacteria into our eye. So always use clean hands when doing this. Next is about administering more than one type of eye drop medication. So as a nurse, this is important you know this and for the patient who's going to be instilling these at home. So the rule of thumb is to space out each type of eye drop that the patient has to take about three to five minutes. So let's say your patient has two eye drops they need to take. So they'll take the one med eye drop medication as prescribed and then they need to wait at least three to five minutes before instilling the other type of medication. And why do we do this? Well, we want that first medication to have time to work, to be in the eye. And if we quickly gave that second type of eye medication, it would just wash out the first. So you definitely want to have that time frame between the types of eye drops. And then let's say your patient has an eye ointment ordered and an eye drop. Which one are you going to give first? You will give the eye drops first and then you will give the eye ointment. So whenever you give your patient those eye drops, how do you instill them in the eye? Well, you're going to place each drop on the lower sac of the eye. And you can see this sac here in this picture on the right. This is called the conjunctival sac. You will not directly put the eye drop on the cornea 
via the eye. Now, after instilling each eye drop medication, you wanna have the patient refrain from blinking, but to keep the eye closed and to perform punctal occlusion. So to do this, you will have the patient or you use your index finger and gently place pressure at the side of the bridge of the nose over the lacrimal punctum. And you can see that at the top picture. That's an up close picture of it. And you'll do this for about two to three minutes. Now, why are we doing this? Well, this is to prevent the medication you just gave them in their eye from draining down into the nasolacrimal duct and being absorbed by the blood, which can cause widespread signs and symptoms. So if you gave this patient a commonly prescribed glaucoma medication like a beta blocker or a cholinergic eye drop, if we didn't perform this punctal occlusion, that medication that's supposed to stay in the eye to do its job can drain down through this tear duct and can enter into the blood and actually cause those signs and symptoms of those medications. And we don't want that to happen. So now let's talk about those medications. So how do medications work? Well, they're going to help lower our IOP and they're going to do it one of two ways or both ways. They're going to decrease production of the aqueous humor and or they're going to increase the drainage of the aqueous humor. So this is great. We're going to get lower intraocular pressure. So to help us remember some of these drugs, because there's quite a few, we're going to remember the ABC. So that's going to help us remember four of them. So first A for alpha agonist, and these tend to end in I-D-I-N-E, like brimotidine, and these work with alpha receptors by activating them. So we'll get the decrease of aqueous humor production um, because it constricts the ciliary body. Remember that producer aqueous humor. And this helps increase the drainage of aqueous humor out of the eye and lowers our IOP. Now remember, Remember, this can cause systemic effects. So we need to do punctal occlusion. And one side effect that some patients can have is that they can feel very drowsy after taking this. Next is B for beta blockers, and they end in O-L-O-L, -L, like Timolol. And these decrease aqueous humor production, and they can cause those systemic effects majorly. So punctal occlusion, very vital. There's different types like cardioselective and non-cardioselective, and they are not for patients with bradycardia, asthma, or COPD. And we talked in depth about this whenever we talked about our beta blocker video, which you can access up here in the right corner if you want to watch that. So with this, you want to assess a patient's breathing and heart rate before administration. Then we have C for carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, and they end in Z-O-L-A-M-I-D-E, so zolamides, and they can be ordered orally or via drops. And one medication type is called acetylzolamide, and these decrease aqueous humor production, so they're like diuretics that inhibit carbonic acid production. Now you want to assess the patient's allergies, because if they have a sulfonamide allergy, they cannot take these medications. And then our last C is for cholinergics, and these are meiotics, and one type is pilocarpine. And how this works is it helps lower the IOP by constricting the pupil, because that's what these drugs do. And this will help increase the drainage of aqueous humor out through that trabecular meshwork. Now it's important to be familiar with the antidote for these drugs, which is atropine. And uh, these drugs can cause that cholinergic effects like sweating, increased salivation, bronchospasm, decreased heart rate, and increase the eye sensitivity with light. So they may have problems with vision and dim light. And again, it's very important that they perform punctal occlusion whenever they take this medication. Some other drugs include prostaglandin analogs, and they end in prost, like bimatoprost. And these increase the drainage of aqueous humor out of the eyes, and they don't tend to cause as many systemic effects as those other medications that we just went over. But an interesting side effect of this medication, and depends on if you like this or not, it can actually cause thicker and longer eyelashes. And I have actually seen this in a patient. It was an older patient and their eyelashes were the most beautiful eyelashes I've ever seen. And I didn't think they were real. And um, I looked in their history and they in fact were taking this medication for the treatment of glaucoma. And another change that this medication can cause is that they can change the color of the iris to a brown color. 
And then lastly, we have Rho kinase inhibitors. And these medications are relatively new for the treatment of glaucoma. And a medication they have is called Natarsodil. And this increases the drainage of aqueous humor by inhibiting the rock pathway. And this pathway is actually found in the trabecular meshwork. So it will cause the meshwork to drain better because remember, we talked about that this meshwork becomes stiff and it doesn't work very well. So it'll start to drain and this will help decrease Increase IOP. Now one thing that this medication can cause because it causes dilation is that it can cause the eyes to become extremely red. And then the last part of our mnemonic is F for factors that increase the development of glaucoma. So to help us remember those risk factors, remember the word save. And we're talking about save your eyesight. So S is for 60 or older, especially if they have a family history. A is for African American, Hispanic, or Asian community. These people are, are at risk for glaucoma. V for vascular problems, such as like with diabetes, hypertension. And then E for elevated intraocular pressure, because remember, generally that normal IOP was 10 to 21 millimeters of mercury. So if they have these risk factors, it's very important that they go for those eye exams so they can try to detect if the IOP is elevated. Okay, so that wraps up this review over glaucoma. And don't forget to access that free quiz that will test you on this material.